Okay, welcome back for this uh, last and third talk of the morning. It will be given by Stéphane Mallard, who's a professor at Collège de France, and he holds the chair of data sciences. And he will speak about mathematical mysteries of deep neural networks. So please. So I'll thank you again very much for the invitation. And uh, I'll be speaking, yes, about uh, deep neural networks. I'm sure you've all heard about it. it. has major impact all over society, industrial products in science. But we really don't understand the underlying mathematics. So what I'll be speaking about is ways to attack the problem, but certainly not of an overall theory uh, to try to understand these uh, um, structures. So uh, the topic in general is the topic of high dimensional learning. So you have basically two types of problems. On one hand, what is called unsupervised learning, where you are given data. So data can be images, sounds, it can be fields coming from physics, as I'm showing here. And what you want to understand is what is the underlying probability distribution of this data, what is its properties. So this typically relates to the talk of uh, Simon just before. If you put yourself in the framework of statistical physics, then it will be about estimating the energy E of X, the Gibbs energy of a system, of an n-body interacting systems. So here I'm giving you examples where you see on the left mass densities uh, in the universe on the right, you see examples coming from fluid turbulences. And then you have second types of problems, which are called supervised learning, where what you want is to answer to a question which is asked on the data. In other words, to estimate the parameter y here, given the data that I will always call x, and you have examples. So for example, x will be an image, and to an image is associated a class. For example, these are mushrooms, cherries, or, or uh, Madagascar cats, and so on. And you have very complex data, images, or 3D data, to which you want to understand how to associate a label. In the context of physics, X would be, for example, the geometry and the specificity of the atoms in a molecule. And you may want, for example, to compute through this kind of uh, regression, uh, the um, atomic energy of the molecule without computing uh, the Schrodinger equation. So to do so, these deep networks have obtained absolutely remarkable results. So what is a deep neural network? You take in input the data X, which is over there. In this case, it's an image. And then you do a convolution with a very small kernel, very small filter. The convolution operator is L1. And you do two to a whole series of convolution that is going to output a whole series of images over there for each convolution kernels. And you are going to subsample. And you get this output. But this output now you're going to transform it with a pointwise nonlinearity which just sets the coefficient to zero. It's called a rectifier if it's negative and keep the coefficient if it's positive. You may use other type of nonlinearity. And then you are going to repeat. You reapply a convolution kernel, sum up the result, put the result in one of these images. This is now the third layer to which you apply your nonlinearity. And then you continue, subsample, subsample, so that the spatial variable is going to almost disappear because of the subsampling. And you have a very nonlinear function phi of x of the input data x, which is this cascade of convolution nonlinearities, convolution uh, nonlinearities. And then you just do a linear uh, combination of your output to estimate the value that you want to estimate y, which is here, in some sense, a functional uh, approximation. Good. Now, you have all these parameters, and these parameters correspond to these convolution kernels uh, over there. So theta is the set of all parameters within this network, and the number of parameters can grow up to billions 
of parameters. So how are you going to optimize these parameters? You are going to optimize the parameters so that the output function is as close as possible to the ideal function, and you are going to test that on the example on which you do know the value of the function, on which you do know the yy, and you are going to establish a metric of error, which will be the loss function. Now, as I was saying at the beginning, the big, big surprise that essentially began in 2010, although the topic has been going on for the last 40 years, was that if you have a network which is sufficiently large, you can approximate extremely complex functions. You can do classification of images as complex as the one you saw you, in your uh, telephone now. Your visual recognition of your face is done by uh, such a system that works better than the human system for faces. You can recognize sounds, speech, languages. You have this incredible uh, system now that produces text from languages, but you can also uh, compute regression in physics, computes energy of molecule, generate signals. And the very strange thing is that essentially the same type of architecture applies to all these problems, which in appearance are totally different. So the mathematical question is why? What is in common between all these problems that look so different? And how come you can do approximations of functions which are functions of very high dimensional variable because x belongs to Rd, but d is typically several millions. An image has several million pixels. So why such architectures? What are the mathematical properties of these nonlinear functions over there? Now, there are few observations you can immediately see. When you look at such an architecture, you see that you have a sequence of convolution of a small neighborhood, subsampling, convolutions and so on. So you progressively aggregate the function, the information on an image, scale per scale. So that looks like a bit like a scale axis. Questions is what's the role of these filters? How are they learned? Why do you need a nonlinearity? What's the role of these uh, nonlinearities? What I will try to show is that trying to attack that kind of question is a mix of many different types of uh, mathematics. Statistics and probability, of course. Optimization, of course, because you need to optimize your parameters. Typically, it's done through a gradient descent. Why is that going to converge? And harmonic analysis. Harmonic analysis, you can see it just by looking at the filters that are being learned on the first layers. They look like small waves, small wavelets. And they were not imposed. They were automatically learned by the systems. How come you see that kind of function appearing? And what's the meaning of the other filters? So I'm going to try to give a, a, a view on these topics in two parts. The first question is, of course, how do we succeed despite the curse of dimensionality? A function in very high dimension corresponds to huge functional spaces. How come we can approximate such function with so little data? The reason, of course, is that there is some kind of underlying regularities behind these functions. So the whole mathematical topic will be about understanding how to define regularities of functions in high dimensions. Now, the first idea that comes to mind is to look for invariants, groups of symmetries. And we'll look at this point of view and we'll see very quickly that it's not enough. There is another look at the problem is to say, well, when you're in very high dimension, one of the key property will be concentration phenomena. And what you really need to do is look at this problem from a probabilistic uh, point of view. Now you have this scale which appears within this architecture that we need to understand. And probability scales in physics, that corresponds to a topic which has been very much developed since the 70s, which is the notion of renormalization group that I'll try to relate. So my goal here will be to show that there is a lot of questions that have been studied in physics and math, which are very much related to the underlying problems. Now, one of the key questions will be to understand scale interaction, which is a classic problem in physics. And I'll try to show why it is absolutely key. And in, one, in some sense, why these networks and how come these networks 
are able to learn these scale interactions. Now, of course, the question is, do we really need to learn? We have prior information on system, physical system. Is it enough to just derive the coefficients of the network? Or is it necessary indeed to learn the way people do? And what is the role of learning? These are the kind of questions I'll try to address. Okay, so let me begin with the basic thing, which is the curse of dimensionality. Okay, you want to approximate a function y, uh, sorry, f of x, so y is the value of f, and you are given example, in other words, you are given the value of the function at different position xi. So the problem doesn't look very difficult. If you want to compute the value of the function at the point x, the immediate idea you may have is to say, let's look at all the x side that are close to x, and we're going to interpolate the value of f at x from the value at, of f that is known at the x side. That's what you do in 1D in 2D. Now, this is bounded to fail. Why is that going to fail? Because you don't have any close neighbor in high dimension. All the points are very far away because the space is absolutely huge. And to realize that immediately, you can try to see how many points you would need if you would want that your points are epsilon away. Obviously, if you are in 0, 1 to the power d, the number of points is going to be epsilon to the power minus d. That's the two-dimensional case. Now, if you take for epsilon 1 over 10, if you take, which is not very small, if you take uh, for d uh, 100, you have 10 to the power 100, which is already more than the number of atoms in the universe, it's impossible to have so much data. And we are not going to be in dimension 100, but in dimension 1 million, which basically means you cannot do anything local in your space. So, if you cannot do anything local, that means that your function f has some form of very strong global regularity that is enough to interpolate from the few point. And the key question of the topic is, what is this regularity? But you also have to take into account that x may not be anywhere. x belongs to a set omega, which are the typical images. And one of the questions is also, what is the support of x in such a problem? Okay, so the first idea that comes to mind to any mathematician is to say, okay, so we have a system like that, a high-dimensional system. Let's look at the symmetries. Why the symmetries? Because if I look at, let's say, the level set of the function, the level set is essentially the class in a classification problem, is the set of all point x such as f of x is equal to y. Well, you can look whether these level sets are invariant to some transformations. So if there exists some operator G, which associates to any point of a given set, another point of the same level set. In other words, that means that the function F is invariant under the action of G. You have a symmetry, which has a group structures, because if you iterate over two symmetry, you still have a symmetry. And so then the question becomes, can I identify the symmetry group of this function? So why would that be fantastic if you could identify such a big symmetry group? Because then essentially, if you know the symmetry group, the only thing that you have to learn is not the level set, but the level set up to a transformation by your symmetry. In other words, you quotient your level set by your, your symmetry group, and the dimension of the level set is reduced essentially by the dimension of the group. So hopefully you're going to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. And the whole difficulty of the problem is that we are in very high dimension. Okay, so if you take that road, then you immediately ask, what are the kind of symmetries that I know on such a problem? Okay, so if you look at the classification problems, let's say digit like that, you want to recognize you have a 3, a 5. The first thing that you see is that it's invariant by translation. If you have a 3, an object, if you translate the object, it's the same object. So you can quotient by the translation group. 
The only problem is that translation group is a two-dimensional group, so you go from dimension one million to one million minus two, big deal. Okay, then what kind of other groups can you get? You can go to the group of diffeomorphism, because if you take an image, there is a video that I won't be able to show here, that you slightly deform, it will look like the same image, or at least belong to the same class. In other words, you have some kind of invariance relatively to some small diffeomorphism. That means that you have a much larger group, which is a group of diffeomorphism, on which you can try to compute your quotient. That was the approach that many of us took, but that's not enough. It's not enough to characterize the structure that you are going to obtain. Okay, so there is really two communities in the mathematical side that looks at that problem. On one hand, a community that is going to have a look at the problem as a functional approximation point of view, and the second the, uh, community that is going to have a look from a probabilistic point of view. And I would like to compare these two points of view through this very naive and badly posed question. Is it more difficult to estimate why when the dimension increase or not? If you are, let's say, Cartesian deterministic, and you view the problem as an interpolation problem of a deterministic function where x is in 0, 1 to the power d, then your space increase when d increase. So, yes, it's going to be much more difficult if the dimension increase. And if you want to fight that, you have to find very strong regularities. On the other hand, you can say, OK, let's look at my function and rather consider the level set of the function, okay? And if I consider the level set from a probabilistic point of view, what I would like to say is try to maximize the probability to observe y given that I, that, that I have x, given, sorry, the answer y given the observation x. If you apply the base relation, this is the same that probability of x given y multiply by something which essentially is not going to depend upon y in most cases. So what does that mean? That means that what you really want to measure is this conditional probability which corresponds to the measure of your level set. It's the probability of x it's the, uh, that can be defined through uh, this measure. Now, think of it. If you, want, if you have an image and you want to recognize wh what is in the image, if I give you more pixels, it should be easier to recognize it. You have more information. So the answer should be yes, it's going to be easier, despite the fact that the space of possibility increase. And why? Because essentially you are going to have a concentration phenomena you have, and you are going to be able to exploit it to get better estimation. And here we are totally changing the point of view. We look at the problem through defining a probabilistic model and approximating a Gibbs energy model. And that's really the point of view of statistics. The point of view, and we are now having 100 years, uh, the publication of Fisher on mathematical statistics was 1922. The, it's an absolutely beautiful paper that is worth to read. We are still on, essentially, the mathematical program of Fisher. What did Fisher say? If you have a set of data Xi, the key problem is to try to model the probability distribution of the data. And what you're going to try to do is to define a priori, a family of probability distribution indexed by the parameter theta, and try to find the best approximation. Now, best in what sense? In the sense that you introduce maximum likelihood. And the idea is the following. If you observe your data, you can look at the probability to observe this data. And if this data is a typical data for your probability distribution, then this probability should be large. Now, if your data is independent, it's a product of the probability of each pieces of data in your data set. Now, if you take the log of the product, you're going to get a sum of log. If I weighted by the number of points, that's going to converge to the expected value. So basically, what you would like to do is to minimize the loss, because I did uh, put a minus in front, which essentially is the expected value of the log probability. And that's what the deep networks do. They are just applying, essentially, Fisher 
recipe, but behind the just, there is a very strong difficulty. How do you minimize this loss? The first idea that comes to mind, and in fact, that's the type of algorithms that are used, is to use a gradient descent. So you update the value of theta by moving in the direction of the gradient of the loss with an epsilon or alpha factor, which is here. And if you want this to converge, if you are in the simple convex case, you have to look at the Haitian of the loss. And that's related to the notion of Fisher information. Now, you all know, when you have a gradient descent, if you compute the Haitian, what you have to make sure is that the step of the gradient descent is smaller than the inverse of the largest eigenvalue. And the problem has to be convex, so you need to make sure that the smallest eigenvalue is strictly positive. And the speed of convergence in this ideal case is going to be exponential and defined by the condition number, which may be very bad sometimes, and most of the case. Now, in these neural nets, there is absolutely no reason why things should be convex. Now, because I want to do math here, I'm going to begin with a simpler model. I'm going to put all the complexity of the neural network in phi of x here. And for now, I'm just going to ask what kind of phi of x I should put here so that just learning a linear model from this phi of x, which is the last layer, would be enough to approximate my probability distribution. The good thing of that is that then the problem is indeed convex, and the Haitian, which you can show is the covariance, is always a positive matrix because it's a covariance. Okay, so now we are back somewhere in statistical physics. We are in the world of statistical physics. In the world of statistical physics, for example, you can look at a continuous version of easing that uh, Hugo uh, Dumenil has spoken about in, earlier in the, in the conference. You can look at maps from cosmology, turbulences. And as I said, in that case, you are going to essentially try to approximate the Gibbs energy. And the idea for approximating the Gibbs energy here is to approximate the Gibbs energy as a linear combination of the output of your neural network and the question, what should phi of x be in order to get a good approximation? And why should we use that kind of architecture that we just showed? What you want is, of course, to have a relatively fast learning and then be able to sample. So these are type of problems that you encounter in physics and in probability. OK, but there is scale. And scales and statistical physics merge through the notion of renormalization group. OK, so what's the idea? And that's going to be very important here because the claim is essentially that's one of the strongest source of regularity of the problem that allows to move in high dimension. If you take a cosmological field like here, the idea of Kedanov first and then Wilson in the 70s was to try to say the way we're going to look at the problem is to progressively coarsen up the field. So you have a field at different resolution that you average subsample, average subsample, and you are going to look at the probability distribution of these fields at different scales. You are going to try to parametrize this probability distribution. And the beauty of a very large set of problems is that when you change the scale, the parameters theta over there, they change very smoothly. This is called the coupling flow in the renormalization group. And if you are in the worst situation, which is exactly at the transition phase, if you renormalize the amplitude of the coefficients, in fact, you have a fixed point. The parameters don't change anymore. So suddenly you found a very powerful source of regularity in these cases. Okay, so that's the work we did with Giulio Biroli, who is a physicist, Thierry Marchand, and Mizaki uh, Ozawa. Let's try to understand now who, how to generate and model such fields. What does that mean, this regularity? It means that if I move progressively, when you move progressively your probability, that means that you look at the conditional probability of the fine scale given the coarser scale. This is what is going to govern the evolution from low dimension to high dimension. This should be regular. 
Now, you can now factorize your problem and say your high dimensional uh, probability is just the sequence of these steps as a Markov chain. Now, the whole problem now is to understand how to capture these conditional probabilities. Now, this image contains all the information of this one. What it doesn't have is what is called the high frequencies, the, free, the degrees of freedom. In other words, the fluctuation that are here, but not here. So that's what we need to extract. Once you've extracted them, the conditional probability here is just about knowing the high frequencies given the low frequencies. So the question is what kind of coordinate to do that? You can do that in Fourier, but that's not what these neural nets seems to do. There is another way to do it, and that was the whole work on the wavelet basis that gave to Yves Meyer the Abel Prize. He was the first to discover that the existence of such orthogonal bases. And the idea essentially is to say you can compute the orthogonal complement, which is here, of the low frequency to the high frequency as a wavelet coefficient. So what is a wavelet? A wavelet is a small wave which is localized, a bit like the filters that I showed you initially. They are going to have, in several dimensions, different orientations. And if you scale these wavelets and translate them, you can get an orthogonal basis of the L2 space. Now, how is that going to work? That you begin from the high resolution image. The way you compute these orthogonal wavelet coefficient is you first coarsen the image, that's the image I showed you, and then you extract the orthogonal wavelet coefficient, which are here. And then you take this image, you go to the next scale, this is the image, and that's the wavelet coefficient associated. So the whole problem now is to understand how to compute these orthogonal coefficient given the low frequency. But you see that they almost looks like a kind of white noise. They have a somewhat simpler structure. So just to give you an intuition what it means from the Fourier point of view, when you take an image, you decompose it at the next scale. These are orthogonal wavelet coefficient which detects the edges in different direction. In the Fourier domain, this is the low frequency image and that corresponds to different frequency bands. And then you sub-decompose again into different frequency band, different frequency band, and so on. So it's really a splitting also of the Fourier space. Now let's come back to the problem. The key questions in this framework is to understand how to compute these conditional probabilities over there, here. So what you need to do is to parametrize them. That means we want to build I almost don't have, yeah, it's over there, a model, a Gibbs energy model, not of the probability itself, of the high frequency knowing the low frequency. And this is a much, much simpler problem because you already know the average structures. You just have to add the detail. If you can do that, then you're going to have a very simple way to go from fine to coarse. You begin in low, uh, low dimension, you compute, the wavelet coefficient given that, you sample them, you get your next scale, you estimate or you sample your probability distribution to get your wavelet coefficient, you go to the next scale, and so on. You climb up the ladder by adding all these probability distributions. So the claim is you can build much simpler models of that. If you do so, you end up into an architecture of a neural network type and you have a problem which is much better condition. So I would like to explain that, and to explain that I'm going to begin with the simplest problem, which is Gaussian models. So that was typically the first models that were used by Kolmogorov in his 1945-62 papers to explain turbulence. So a Gaussian model is a model where the probability distribution is a quadratic probability distribution defined by the covariance matrix. So in this case, the uh, function phi of x is just the second order moments. And the parameter theta that appears here is the inverse of the covariance matrix. That's what you are supposed to learn. OK, now we are going to be in a case where in order to learn, you have need to have a condition number if you do a gradient descent, which is good. What is the condition number? 
If you look at the condition number of the covariance matrix, you can verify easily, if you compute the covariance of phi of x, that the Haitian of your optimization problem is going to be proportional to kappa squared. So if you have a badly conditioned covariance, your gradient descent is going to be very bad. What kind of covariance do we have? If you look at turbulent flow, and most n-body problems which have multi-scale phenomena, the power spectrum, in other words, the eigenvalue of the covariance, have a power low decay, which is shown over there. Typically, they decay like omega to the power minus eta. So if you look at the inverse of the covariance, it's going to grow like omega to the power eta. So the uh, condition number, which is the ratio between the largest eigenvalue and the smallest eigenvalue, is going to be huge when your image is large. Of course, the second problem is that this is a very bad model of turbulence. This is the Gaussian process, which has exactly the same second order moment as this turbulent flow. So obviously, we will need to go beyond Gaussian. But let's stay one second with Gaussian to understand the idea of this kind of splitting. Okay, so you have a singular operator, which is a homogeneous singular operator. And here you end up, boom, into this whole program on the analysis of singular operators between the 70s and essentially the 90s of Calderon Zygmunt, or 60s even, trying to understand how to precondition such operators. And that's why, in fact, you may have worked over wavelet basis, because there is a way to do that, which is very much related to the classical techniques that were used to do it, which consists in decomposing into wavelet basis and then just renormalize the coefficients, the diagonal. Now, why? Because when you decompose in a wavelet basis, as I showed, essentially you split the frequency into dyadic intervals. And within each of these dyadic intervals, the spectrum essentially varies by a constant value. And therefore, you can verify that if you split within wavelets and you renormalize your coefficient, you have a Haitian which is totally well conditioned and you are going to have a very fast estimation of your parameters. Good, but this is too simple. This is too simple because the fields are not uh, Gaussian. So let's, step to the let's move to the next step. In statistical physics, the next step are easing type models and is, which have a local potential, and easing in the continuous framework, so is the so-called phi-4 model. So it's an energy potential which has a quadratic term, like a Gaussian, which is given by the Laplacian, this is the kinetic energy, and you have a scalar potential. So if you scalar potential, you decompose it on a basis such as polynomial, you can always write it the way we want to write it. Now, what is this potential? For 5,4, it's a potential which is going to enforce the value of your pixel to either be minus 1 or 1 with a double well potential. If the temperature is large, that's the inverse temperature, smaller than critical, you have a disordered system. When you arrive at critical temperature, that was again the topic of the talk of uh, Hugo, you arrive to a critical phenomena where you see appearing very long range correlation which creates these long domains with similar colors. Now, here you are in a situation where everything is very badly conditioned and that's one of the big numerical problems in this field. Now, if instead of trying to sample and model the field directly in this world, you model it by looking at the conditional probability on the wavelet coefficient, which are renormalized. You can show numerically that everything is well conditioned. And when you look at the convergence of the algorithm, instead of taking several thousands iteration, which degrades when the critical, uh, you arrive to critical temperature, you have a problem which doesn't anymore depend upon the temperature, and you have a fast convergence. OK, but these are toy models. So the next step was to move to things which are a little bit more realistic. This corresponds to images of weak lensing, which corresponds to mass distributions uh, simulated for the future Euclid missions. 
And if you use the same kind of models, which are multi-scale models, where at each scale, what you compute is the conditional probability distribution of the wavelets, you can simulate such uh, uh, models. You can explicitly compute the energy, and I think that was the first time these were computed. But you cannot go beyond. You don't get turbulence with such models. And I want just to show the kind of network we have at this stage. What we did is a wavelet transform, and the only thing that we did is to compute a nonlinear potential across the wavelet coefficient conditioned by the low frequency which is shown here. And this is too simple, and this is not going to work, we tried, for turbulence. So, what is missing? I'm going to take a very structured image, a boat, and look at the wavelet coefficient at different scale. Obviously, they are large along the edges, okay? And the edges, they propagate. So what you observe is that there is a very strong dependency of coefficients across scales. And the key point is to capture this dependency, because if you capture this dependency, then you may be able to capture the geometry. So yes, the coefficients are sparse, most of them are zero, but strongly dependent. So what you really want is indeed to have better model of this conditional probability, which is about modeling the conditional probability of this, given that you know the wavelet coefficient at the coarser scale. Now, why is that? So what do we want to do? We want to compute this conditional probability. And what I'm saying essentially is that computing this conditional probability will require to sophisticate a little bit more the network. You have different avenues to do that. The first idea is to say, let's move to high order moments, but there are too many of them and that didn't work for many years of research. You could learn it with a convolution network and that works very well. But we, what I would like to show is that for physical problems such as turbulence or mass distribution in cosmology, you don't need to learn the potential. You know enough. So what's the problem? The reason why it is difficult to understand the dependencies of wavelet coefficient at different scale is that their correlation is zero, their linear dependence is zero. And why is that? It's because they have a phase fluctuation and when you compute the expected value of this phase fluctuation, you essentially get zero. It's due to the fact that the Fourier support of the wavelets is essentially disjoint. So what you can do is kill the phase. And essentially, the high order moments are doing that indirectly. How can you kill the phase? By putting a modulus. And therefore, look at the correlation of the wavelet coefficient. But after putting a modulus, here you have a phase information. This is through. Uh, these modulars. Now, at the same time, you don't want to keep a huge covariance matrix. You just want to keep few coefficients in order to be able to estimate them. And one observation is that this covariance matrix, which is a huge covariance matrix, you can compress it, but to compress it, you have to retransform it with a linear operator. And in this case, it happens to be, again, a wavelet transform. So what are you doing? you are essentially computing a wavelet transform, applying a nonlinearity, which is this modulus or keeping the coefficients, and then, oops, reapplying a wavelet transform and your nonlinearity, normalize everything, compute the covariance at each layer. And that defines you a neural network, but where you haven't yet learned the weight. Okay, what is this giving? For all the fields which are ergodic stationary fields with which we encounter in physics that we've been testing, we get very good models. This corresponds to uh, high resolution uh, weak lensing images in cosmology. This is a 2D turbulence. This is the cosmological web distribution of masses. This is uh, turbulences. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sorry. I think it's uh, of gases. And what you see here are images which are generated by sampling the model. And what the model just did is compute these scattering coefficient, estimate the parameter theta, and then sample 
the probability distribution from coarse to fine. Okay, is that enough? Does that mean you don't need to learn in deep network? The answer is no. You do need to learn, and that's where I'm going to show you why that kind of technique stops uh, at one point. And this will be clear by moving to regression and classification problem. So first of all, these type of problems are very, very close to, from what I described. Why so? Because the problem is going now to be to compute the conditional probability of y given x with a model. And as I explained, it's, a, it's like computing the probability of x given y if the probability of each class is uh, constant. Okay, so you could apply the same kind of thing, which means take x, compute a wavelet transform, Apply your nonlinearity, a second wavelet transform over there, apply your nonlinearity, and then propagate everything to the output layer by averaging so that you get your very small images at the output layer. And you get an operator, which is here called a scattering operator, and then do a linear classification to estimate your log probability. That's called a linear classifier. Now, why does that make sense? It's why it's not completely crazy to do that. Because from the point of view of the symmetries, it does the right job. If you take your probability distribution, as I said, when if you take an image of a class, if you deform it, so a deformation, small deformation consists in moving each point by a function here, tau of u, which is going to be C1, and whose uh, Jacobian is going to be small, so that you have a small distortion of the local metric, then that kind of transformation, and that was illustrated in the video that you don't see, is going to be almost locally linearized by the network I described. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you take a small deformation, if you look at the metric of a deformation and the weak metric of deformation essentially looks at how much you move at most and what is the maximum amplitude of your uh, Jacobian, you can show that the error between, in terms of L2 error, so you just subtract the coefficient between the output of your network computed with these wavelets and of the network where the input was the deformed image, is of the order of the size of the deformation. In other words, you have something which is locally Lipschitz, which means that you are linearizing small deformations, and that means that you can kill small deformation with a linear projection. Uh, I'm going to very quickly just go over quantum chemistry in one second, just to say it's the kind of topics that people are uh, studying. In quantum chemistry, the problem is to compute the energy given the position and the charges of the atoms. And the usual way to do it with, for example, DFT, is to uh, compute the electronic density for which Kohn and Sham got their Nobel Prize. And the idea here is not to go through Schrodinger, but to say, okay, we know some invariance of the problem. We know that the energy is invariant to translation rotation. It's regular when you have small deformation. It's intrinsically multi-scale because you have covalent bounds and you have long-range uh, interactions such as van der Waal forces. So you could try to compute such things with a neural net. And people have developed neural networks that works remarkably well and which are now used in industry to try to synthesize new molecules which have low uh, ground state energies. Here I'm going to use this very naive network, which is just a cascade of wavelet nonlinear nonlinearity with the modulus. And if you put in input just the, the position of the atoms and their amplitude, which is the number of charge as Dirac, you get interference patterns because each Dirac emits a wavelet in some sense. They all interfere in the network. And then you average everything. You get invariance, and then you do a linear regression. Why should it work? Not clear. You have the appropriate invariant, but why should it be able to linearly regress quantum energy? The answer is nobody knows right now, but the fact is it does a very good job as long as the molecules is not too large. Deep network, which are much bigger, 
are able now to regress quantum energies of molecules, which are much, much bigger than the nine uh, heavy atoms that appears in the database that we use here. So when the problem is simple, you can do that kind of strategy. What I want now to show is that when the problem is complicated, as when you deal with very large molecule, you do absolutely need to learn. And what is being learned is, as I was saying, a mystery. So to try to understand again, I'm going to speak about the work of Joanne Brunat here. The idea here is let's apply that to classify images with a linear classifier. If you have a classification problem, such as classifying digits, this is a simple problem because within a class, let's say the class of threes, the only variation is translation and deformations. We know that that kind of representation is able to be invariant to translation and can linearize deformation, therefore can compute invariance to deformations. And indeed, with a scattering transform or a deep network, you do about the same. If your problem is to classify texture, stochastic ergodic processes, same thing, you do about the same. If your problem is to classify cars, dogs, meats, counterness ships, uh, whatever, leopard, and so on, it doesn't work. In the sense that a deep network does an error which is five times smaller than this very naive network. And there are even bigger networks that do even better. So the question is, what's happening now? We've gone so far from our prior information. What is being learned? So it's very, the first idea that comes to mind is let's, let's open these networks and look what is inside. And many people tried that. And the problem is that you have billions of disordered coefficients. And up to now, essentially, nobody has been able to get any theory from the analysis of the inside. So the other type of strategy that was tried by Florent Tangut and uh, John uh, Zarka is to say, okay, let's try to complexify these networks by putting some learning. So the idea is, we know that wavelets are good to compute multi-scale representation, so let's keep the wavelet. But then the potential, the nonlinear potential that governs the interaction across scale, we don't know really what it is. We have really no prior, we are going to learn it. So you just learned, this is called, for the one who knows deep network, a one-one convolution which about a linear combination of all the coefficient at a fixed position. You don't mix different position, you fix the position and ju you just look across the different orientation here. And then you do the same thing at the next scale and now you are mixing the scales and the orientations, but the filters remain wavelets. So the spatial filters are wavelets, but you learn the potential. So that was their idea. So now you get really a deep net. The only thing is you fix the spatial uh, filters, and at the end you did do a linear classification. So that's the image. The spatial filters are just wavelets, but you learn the uh, interactions between the channels. You do that at each scale. And then you optimize the interaction across the channels by minimizing the classification error, so with your gradient descent. This is a standard deep net algorithm. So what I said is that if you just don't apply this mixing of channels, this is what the standard scattering transform do, you have a much bigger error than the standard deep net. If now you learn these one-one convolution, you go to the level of the deep net classification. So what that means is that the learning part is really not the way you aggregate spatially the pixel, because you know about the topology of the space and you know that you are essentially going to end up doing something like a wavelet transform. What you need to understand is how to compute the interaction across orientations, across scales, and so on. And that can be very, very complex. And that is what is stored within these filters P. So what are the properties of these potentials, these filters, we don't know. But what is spectacular 
is that if when you begin to adapt that kind of potential, you can address very different problems from physics to cars to uh, sounds and so on. And I'm going to uh, end on this, so by trying to summarize a few key ideas. So, again, from a math point of view, the whole topic is about finding regularities. But you can analyze that from a functional analysis point of view. And although I'm rather born on the Cartesian French functional analysis side, after many years of failures, <laughs> I end up moving on the Anglo-Saxon side of the Bayesian framework because, yes, here I do really believe that the problem in high dimension is essentially a problem of probability, a problem of concentration. But it doesn't mean that functional analysis doesn't disappear and then harmonic analysis disappear because you have structure. And the whole problem is to understand how to structure these probability distribution. And scale remains a key element. We know that all over science. So regularity across scale is really the key question. So now you encounter the operators which governs the regularity across scale. When you are Gaussian, it's a linear operator and you are back to, as I was saying, this whole studies of calderon zygmunt operator, but most interesting problems are nonlinear, and now you are facing very, very different mathematical problems. So the whole question is to understand that. Now, that's where nonlinearity, as I was saying, appears. Because you need to understand the interaction, you have to kill somewhere the phase which kills the correlations. That was one possibility. I'm sure there are many different strategies, but you can think of a rectifier as an operator that does that. And then, what are these networks doing? One thing which seems to be clear is that they have some form of memory. And somewhere within this operator P, which are huge, somewhere is stored some form of memory. What kind of storage of memory? What is the organization? It's a totally uh, open problem. So, and I'll co uh, conclude of that. This is a reference on the paper with Giulio Biroli, uh, on the relation uh, with renormalization groups and weighting. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, there's time for some questions. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, yes, the question I, I have is, um, how does your, your analysis extend to languages and, say, transformer networks? Languages, natural language processing, and, and transformer networks. The, I, I think we can define a notion of scale also in that, in that case, even though it's not that, that evident. So I would like to, to have your opinion so you on mean, that. So uh, there is transformers, and you mentioned something else than transformers? And languages. Just languages language and transformers. Yes. Okay, the beauty, so I didn't speak about transformers because it's even more complicated. What essentially transformers are doing, they are discovering very long-range interaction, and they are suddenly discovering there is a different notion of neighborhood, not just a spatial neighborhood, which relates far away object. For example, a negative in a sentence can affect uh, ne pas, uh, not to, can affect the whole meaning of the sentence, have very long-range implication, and they are discovering, in some sense, the topology. So it's much more complicated because the topology is not given. And it's a whole very interesting uh, open problem that indeed I'm not addressing. Here, the reason why harmonic analysis appears is because you have, you know the topology of the space, you know the grid. The day you destroy the topology by saying, I'm going to learn it, and again, the amazing thing is that it does. It does, but still, it knows, you know, in a sentence, there is a topology, which is a succession of words, two words which are close, a priori are going to have more influence one on the other than a very far away, but it can be discovered. So the answer is another beautiful problem. <laughs> other questions, remarks? Yes? Thank you, very Hello. nice talk. Um, just what you just mentioned uh, as an answer to the question that we should exploit structure. And of course, uh, 
that is a good thing to do. But I just wonder experimentally, have you tried? You can do your wavelet structure basis function and then use these as new features and just stick it into the neural network. Instead of the linear regression, you do a, a bit of additional layers and would it become worse or not if I stick it into the, into the deep network? That might give some sort of information whether the network does something completely orthogonal somehow to the structure which you put in a priori. Okay, so uh, we did that kind of thing which is first do the kind of network I described without learning and then learning and showing that you can learn fewer layers, three layers we were getting uh, ImageNet type uh, result. Uh, and that's after that that we arise, we shouldn't do one and then the other, but uh, mix them. Now the question, are the networks doing that? I don't know, but, <laughs> but I, what we know is that the first filters are like that. We know that the filters are small and that they subsample. So they know, we know that it's a kind of multi-scale representation. So I'm sure that the networks don't learn wavelets exactly, but I'm not sure that it's not sufficient to put them in. Now, does it simplify it considerably the problem? When the problem is complicated, no, because learning the interaction operators is what is really difficult. When the problem is simple, like, and what I call simple is turbulence or uh, cosmological web and so on, Yes, it's worth it because you don't need to learn at all. And then you can do the physics because then you can look at the terms. The problem of deep net is that they get beautiful results, but because it's a black box, when you want to do physics and understand what you had, it's difficult, as you know. So what I really think is that it's not going for quite a long time to improve anything on the algorithmic side because these guys are too good, too many, and they have spectacular results. It's rather on the other side where the problems are in fact not so difficult in the sense not so macroscopic. And there I think that neural nets can help us a lot to do things analytically. Yeah, I, I think you answered the, my question, but it was, uh, did you try to, to make the last layer uh, be a linear function of all of the pre preceding layers, not just an aggregation of the preceding layers? So, the last layers in, in the, the, the last uh, architecture that I described, the last layer is a function of all the other layers. Ah, okay, Oops, okay, okay. It's not there, sorry. It's okay. The last layer is indeed a function of all the others because you are cascading your operators. Okay, okay. And this is the thing that gives So, it is, this is really a standard neural net architecture. Is there some? Okay. Thank you for the talk. So I have maybe a, a, an off topic question, but I understand that you inject a prior on the structure of the networks just to, to get this uh, invariance uh, uh, property through your scales. And then you, you look at a way to have a good Hessian, a good conditioning of the Hessian. And this is uh, the right thing to do on the statistical side of, of the learning problem. But then if you want to learn these, uh, these uh, layers, uh, you can do a heuristic, a, a, I mean, an empirical uh, study. And you, I mean, there are some papers showing that the, the it's better when the Hessian is bad condition in the sense that you will have flat valley and then you can hope to, to get to, towards this minimizes. And um, <coughs> actually when the valley is very spiky, um, they show empirically that the generalization of their network is not so good. So I was wondering if uh, you could make some link between, of course, the conditioning of the theoretical uh, network that you want to, to, to force, but the conditioning of the, of the network that you want to, to learn. So, 
I, uh, so thanks. It's, uh, it's important, uh, an important question because what you are outlining is that these networks work in regime that we're absolutely not used to, like having very badly conditioned uh, Haitian, very flat valleys, but they are able to hop, or over parametrization, put much, much more parameters than the number of data, and that regularized, in fact, the optimization. So you are right to point out these, which I'm absolutely not addressing in, uh, in this question, and which are, again, fascinating questions. Uh, what I'm, the, the difficulty also of trying to, so the, the frontier of research and numerical research is uh, quite far. So there are these optimization questions and there are people, as you pointed out, who addressed it. What's happening is that if you look at the research environment, it's very divided. You have the people who do the optimization, that kind of problem. You have people who are doing the statistical side. You have people like uh, myself and many others who are rather trying to look at structures and so on. And what is right now very difficult is to build up the bridges between these things. Uh, in some sense, I think physics can help. Say, physics can help because it provides us with a very good framework where a lot of things are known. When you try to attack that kind of problem of optimization over cats and dogs and so on, we don't know what is a cat, what is a dog on an image and so on. It's very hard. In the physical framework, hopefully it will be easier because there is a lot of things which are known. But what you're pointing out is important and again, my answer is I don't know how to do the link. Okay, another one. Oh, ups, up there. Um, since you're on the probabilistic rather than the determinant sides, you're up against um, uh, a wave functions, probabilistic methods. Aren't you going to be bumping into uncertain, a minimum uncertainty as in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle using uh, probabilistic methods so that there will be some lower limit to the accuracy in which you can actually get results? Yes, absolutely, and this limit in particular uh, in this case is going to be fixed by the amount of data and the variance of your estimators, which uh, it's not a Heisenberg uncertainty uh, problem here, but uh, yes, you have a limited uh, precision. But in some sense, this is a central topic of statistics. And uh, that's a little bit one point I was trying to say is that what we are doing here deep down is really we are working on the Fisher program of statistics, which is these machines are huge parametrized models. And there are all the problems of huge parametrized model. How do you build estimators? And as you are pointing out, there's a lot of intrinsic errors when doing that. And in fact, the 1922 paper of Fisher says there is one object to analyze, that is the Fisher information. And that is going to give you, through the kramer bound, the limit, the uncertainty below which you will not be able to go. So that's the uh, statistical view of the problem. There may be another view uh, from the functional analysis uh, uh, point of view. Uh, up to now, the approach of, of functional analysis gave very, very pessimistic results because facing constantly the curse of dimensionality. But in the functional analysis point of view, the notion of Heisenberg uh, uncertainty would come more naturally. Oh, thank you. So that Fisher limit may end up to be the minimum uncertainty, actually. Yeah, but, you know, the, 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 it, we are still quite far from uh, the notion of uncertainty under... Uh, the Heisenberg notion. This is really related to non-commutations of operators. And uh, I, I must say, this high-dimensional problem, I don't see it under this view, but maybe, maybe there. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid it's about time to close this, uh, this session. And I propose we thank Stefan and the previous speakers of the session. Thank you.